You're listening to a bonus episode of the Dairy Age, featuring Chagask's weekly Let's Talk Dairy webinar series, which is also available as a podcast. So, you are all very welcome um, to this week's edition of Let's Talk Dairy. Um, my name is James Dunn. So, I suppose our next speaker um, for the remainder of the webinar is Ruth Fennell. Um, Ruth is a dairy advisor, as I said, in Dungarvan in Waterford and is going to speak on breeding beef from the dairy herd. So I suppose, Ruth, you've, you, you have worked as both a dairy advisor, then a dry stock advisor, and now a dairy advisor. Um, again, so you, you've, you've seen it from both sides as such. So I suppose maybe just to kick it off, why why is this space? Why is there a lot of conversation around this? I know you said at an event recently in Kildalton and you spoke on this. Um, why is that whole um, breeding beef from the dairy herd? Why is it important to dairy farmers? Given the fact that a lot of them don't rear their own calves, I suppose if we if we look at the national figures, fifty seven percent of the national slaughter kill originated um, from dairy herd originally, um, and I suppose the while I appreciate a large proportion of dairy farmers are are not keeping beef calves themselves that they're probably being sold off for farm, it's hugely important that we have over twenty three thousand um, beef farmers that are involved in rearing stock at at different levels, whether that's buying calves or buying wheelings or stores. And maybe some of them are buying them from calves and bringing them to finish and others are are buying them at a later stage and, and trading them on again. But in order for that for that to continue, it's really important that there's a margin for those farmers to make out of it. And mm-hmm. I suppose there's a huge emphasis then previously, you know, I suppose with the expansion in the dairy herd, when the quotas were gone, there was probably a big increase in the number of replacement heifers being bred. But I suppose with the stabilization in the numbers of the dairy cows um, and also a lot of people, I suppose cows are, are lasting longer within the herds. Our replacements um, requirements for replacements are not as strong as what they previously were. And I suppose we have a better opportunity now, um, you know, to, to do selection and, and to improve the quality of the calf that we have so that, you know, I suppose the research is telling us that those that were previously buying calves, those numbers are, are dropping on an ongoing basis. Um, it's not the easiest job in, in rearing calves, but I suppose the, it's really important, therefore, that as a dairy farmer, that we sell a, a calf that, that's healthy and well, and that there's a margin there for the person that buys it from us so that he can get something out of it going forward as well, too. And I suppose it's an important partnership that should that should be, um, you know, nurtured along the way so that you build up relationships with your customers that come in um, and that those customers are happy to come back and buy off you again in, in subsequent years. Yeah, so really it's about producing a quality product and building that rapport and trust with, with their fellow farmers and, and fellow calf buyers. Exactly. Um, so in terms of, is there is there a selection tool available or what should our, our dairy farmer listeners, what should, they be, what should they be looking at now in terms of, there's always a lot of emphasis on picking dairy sires, but more emphasis now on picking, picking quality beef sires. Um, is there a tool there available to dairy farmers? Uh, there is James yeah and I suppose where we're probably starting is 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 at the very beginning of of selecting the cows that we're going to use to breed our replacements first um, and I suppose we've seen huge strides in relation to the the EBI and the genetics that can be improved by selecting suitable bulls but for those that are pretty much at the top end of their game it's getting harder and harder to make um, more rapid progress and I suppose one of the areas that's come in now is I suppose with the reduction in our requirements for replacements that we can start making a much harder selection on the cows that we're going to use to breed our our dairy replacements and therefore the remaining herd are are being used then to breed our, our, our beef stock going forward. I suppose with the introduction of sex semen as well too, um, it's had huge advances in relation to the, I suppose, the use of beef AI on, on the dairy herd. So I suppose we're very fortunate in Ireland in relation to the genetic um, work that's being done. Um, the main tool I suppose that people are going to use is probably um, the, the dairy beef index. Um, there's been some significant changes in relation to the dairy beef index um, over the, the last year. And I suppose the tool of that was trying to combine the attributes that the dairy farmer is looking for, which is your short gestation, easy calving um, and good survival rates, with also then the traits that the beef farmer was looking for as well, too. So um, good growth rates, um, good feed conversion efficiencies, um, 
and there's been changes made in relation to that that dairy beef index. So previously, up until last year, the calving traits were making up 49% of that, that total index when we looked at that dairy beef index. And what's happened in January this year is that 49% has been reduced to 31%. And for the first time um, in the world, there's a breeding objective um, selection tool that's also incorporating a carbon sub-index as well too. So that's why the, I suppose the, the dairy um, calving traits have been reduced slightly is to make way as well for that for that um, carbon sub-index. And I suppose with all the talk about um, greenhouse gas emissions and our carbon efficiencies on farm, what they're taking into account in relation to that, that carbon sub-index is um, gestation length, age at slaughter and carcass weight as well too. Um, and that's coming in both on the beef side and also on the, the carbon side as well too. So yeah, I suppose we're starting with, with using that dairy beef index. I think one thing that's really important in relation to that as well too, I just pulled out some of the, the figures there earlier and was looking through them, is to look a little more detail as to where the values of those sub-indexes are coming from. So if we look at the, the dairy beef index and we pick up two bulls that are on that active bull list, they're both 24 and 25 on the list. They both have exactly the same value of 150 euro for their dairy beef index, but they're coming from very different um, strengths within the traits. So one of them is very strong on the beef side of it. I and mean, it's making up a good bit of ground in relation to that. And the other is making up it on the short gestation and the easy calving and the strengths that are going with that. So yes, very important that we look at the dairy beef index, but also look into the components of that so that you get the selection criteria of what you want as well too going forward. So it's no different than really your EBI tool and the fact that uh, you have one single figure, um, Ruth, but ultimately, as you say, you really need to delve into it then look within the sub-indexes. Yeah, so if we're using, say, the Sire Advice report, um, if you go into your ICBF, you go into your Sire Advice, and you'll see a button on the top left-hand side of the screen, and that allows you to select also beef bulls when you're doing your dairy herd. So we put a huge emphasis on scrolling through all those catalogues at the beginning of the year um, and trying to pick the, the, the dairy bulls for our cows. But we now also have the opportunity and it's all laid out in front of us. So we select our, our dairy bulls as we would have previously done. And then we go in and we select in relation to the beef bulls on the dairy beef index. And like the dairy herd, we can narrow our selection criteria. So in a lot of farms, um, I would have clients that would have just when the AI man comes, it's look what I want a short gestation, easy calving beef bull for this. And this little emphasis then on the beef traits of it. But what we can do now is that we can still select on short gestation, easy calving, but also then put in a good beef trait. So in a lot of cases, I, I, when we're making up lists for people, we will put it in, in a beef trait of above 100 euro. And on the basis of that, then that allows us to pick those that, yes, they're, they're short gestation and easy calving, but they also have the better beef traits that our beef customers are going to look for when they go forward to try and finish those animals as well, too, and make a profit on them. So, yeah, you've touched on that in terms of the selection. So you're looking at a beef sub index of, of above 100 euros for the viewers on, on, on the call in, in terms of, um, I suppose, what are the criteria um, exactly? How do you lay it out now? As you say, very often was bull of the day or one bull fits all right across a, a farming system. Um, maybe explain when you're dealing with your clients how now you're selecting beef sires. Um, because that concern is there, Ruth, in terms of that Cavanese gestation length, that, that, that's the real concern among dairy farmers, I suppose. Does that need to increase um, or, or can we get suitable sires with better beef traits while still maintaining that easy calf and short gestation? Look, I suppose, um, as I said earlier, there's a lot of people that will start maybe using the, the beef AI at the beginning of the breeding season because they'll have identified cows that they don't plan on breeding their replacements off. So in the past, I suppose, and with, when we were trying to look at expansion and increasing numbers, maybe for the first number of weeks, everything that came through that was that was ready to breed was was given a Frisian straw. Whereas with the emphasis now on, on trying to improve the quality of those replacements, we're doing a lot more selection in relation to the cows. So when we go into our, our sire advice report, we can select the cows that we are using for, 
for Frisian breeding. And we can select those that are going to get our, our beef straws as well, too. Generally, where I start is I will open the EBI report of, of the individual farm that we're doing up the sire advice for. And I look at where they are in relation to the beef sub index. So if you go into your EBI report, you generate your most recent report. It will give you a figure for your individual herd and you can see where you are. So if we look at nationally, I am on the dairy herds, the average beef sub index value is minus three euro. OK, and what we're trying to do is when we select bulls, what we want to do is to put the progeny that result from that on the commercial breeding value to give them a value that's either going to be um, if we're talking about a dairy cross beef bred animal and we want it to be better than the average, then the progeny that are born as a result of that have to have a value in excess of 69 euro. So if we've got a, if we're a nav, national average herd and our beef sub index is minus three, then we want bulls that have a minimum value of above 71 in order to get above the average in relation to the progeny that will be born on that, on that CBV value. If we're looking at a higher level then, and we're looking to try and get into the top 20% of those dairy beef bred animals, the, the figure for that is 124. So anything from 126, um, in relation to the beef value on, on those sires will get the progeny that are born as a result of that breeding into the top 20%. And therefore, we probably put ourselves in a better position from, from a marketing point of view going forward in relation to that. So, yeah, absolutely. In terms of having a look at your own cows and then selecting accordingly within the beef sub index. Yeah. I suppose um, the advantage then too with the with the sire advice is, is that there's very strong reliability figures for those. So when we go into the beef sub index, um, depending on when people are, are selecting to breed, we may not necessarily be looking for short gestation if we're happy maybe for to start breeding with with our beef AI maybe a week before what we would start with our dairy AI and it might not necessarily have to be a minus for gestation if we're prepared to do that and we may be able to get stronger beef traits but we can also put into that selection criteria and um, the score that we're prepared to to accept in relation to calving difficulty so in a lot of cases I will I will put in say uh a maximum of 4% calving difficulty on the cows. And I want a minimum of 85% reliability on those figures. And I will still get a good list that are meeting that criteria above the 100 euro on the on the, the beef index as well too. So look, the figures are there um, and it's just a matter of, of, I suppose, maybe planning a little bit in advance and, and ordering a few of those straws rather than leaving it to the end and seeing what's available on the day. A question in there from from our viewers in terms of um, should they pick a team of bulls? Um, I suppose to suit different to suit different cows and and even different parity structures within the herd, and, and maybe just comment on that route. Yeah, I suppose look at when we're talking about our our heifers or our first lactation animals, and look for all for all on the dairy herd. I suppose that the ease of calving is a very important figure, but obviously as a mature cow will be able to you know, maybe manage a, a slightly increase in, in calving difficulty figure than what we might be prepared to accept on a, on a, on a first lactation or a heifer as well too. Um, so yes, depending on where we're, we're starting on and what animals we're, we're going. So what we did when we um, prepared for the event in Kildalton was we compiled a list um, of, of two different lists of bulls, one of those that were above zero for gestation length. And as I said, we put in the selection criteria of no more than 4% calving difficulty, um, a minimum of 85% reliability and a beef value greater than 100. And we also then compiled a list for those that were minus for gestation. And I suppose on, on the first table where we were above the zero, we would consider maybe using those bulls that would probably more than likely have stronger beef traits. Um, they would be the more beef type animals. And we might choose those on our mature cows and start using those a week or so before we would start our Frisian AI. So even if they do carry three or four or even five days in, in the gestation compared to, to the other bulls, they will still calve around the same time as a result of that because we started breeding. So, yes, we will use different bulls depending on where in the breeding season we're do, dealing with. And also, I suppose, like certainly down here, we will have a proportion of herds where there's a Jersey influence. Um, and in order to compensate for that, we will be probably looking for higher beef merit figures um, for the bulls that we're selecting to try and compensate um, for that as well, too. And we can still, with a Jersey influence, still get animals that would have a good CBV value going forward where we've taken the care to select stronger beef merit bulls. Absolutely. And that's a very important point in terms of meeting character specification with the right bull used, Ruth. 
um, there's no issues in terms of um, meeting character specs with, with those genetics. Um, another question in there, um, in terms of targets, I suppose you mentioned cavities on the between heifers and cows. There's the opportunity there to select on on cavities for both heifers and cows. Is is, is that correct? There is yes, and look at obviously with a heifer, we're we're only going to select those that are that are deemed as as calving difficulty that where the figure is low, um, and we want to give those every chance. We're not just because we're selecting beef bulls, we're not shying away from the fact that the most important traits on the dairy side is the easy calving and and the gestation length and the survivability of those calves as well too. But we're just bringing the beef um, emphasis into it as well too. So we're still selecting highly and with good reliability figures on those um, for our for our, our beef um, sires, but we're also keeping in mind the beef traits as well too. And we would have said before, it's very hard to marry the two. It, it's it's not a complete walk in the park, but we can do it. And we just need to be uh, aware of that and select accordingly then. Yeah, and I think so. I think, look, at speaking to groups, um, no different than yourself over the last number of weeks, um, a lot of farmers have placed greater emphasis over the, the previous breeding season and haven't run into any increased calving difficulties. As you say, by, st- by minding both sides of the, by minding both sides of the traits in terms of still minding the calving traits, but ultimately increasing the beef merit of their calves, which is, yeah. shows the tool is working, Ruth. And I suppose a lot of them now where we've been fortunate is that the CBV value is available for for the dairy farmers to view um, for his own stock that he's bred. So if you go into your view profiles on your ICBF um, account um, and scroll down to the view profile section and go into the CBV value, what it does is it lists the CBV value, which is the commercial breeding value for all of the, the stock that are on your farm that are eligible for a rating. So there are um, dairy cross dairy males are dairy cross beef males and females um, and then if there's any circular bread on the farm as well too and it gives us that value for each individual um, animal that's on the farm not only as a euro value but also on a star rating basis and it's a great tool then for if I was a farmer and I was looking to to possibly sell stock I can use that and say look I the stock that I've bred here are um, significantly better than the average of what you're going to find. And these animals should return 150 euro more to you than than, than another calf that has a, a lower value than, than than what these have. So it's a great tool to be able to market stuff going forward as well too. Explain to the people, and um, absolutely in terms of it, it, it's another selection tool. And sometimes um, we need to simplify these things that can get complicated. So ex- explain to us a little bit, what is CBV? And I suppose, what role do you see it playing over the coming years, Ruth? OK, so I suppose the, it's trying to put a value on comparing one calf with another calf. So if we go to a pen and we look at, at I don't know, let's just say two Angus calves that are off, off, a dairy, off a dairy cow, OK? And we could have massive variations in relation to the CBV value. So we could have one that has a CBV value of 20 and we could another one that has it at 150. And what it means is, is that at the end of the day, that calf should, when we compare 20 versus the 150, should leave 130 euro more in in my pocket at the end of the day when I bring that calf to finishing. And that's through a combination of a number of different things. So where we spoke about the dairy beef index um, being a combination of the beef traits um, and the calving traits on on the, the dairy side, the commercial breeding value is really taking into account all, it's it's excluding all the calving traits. So if I'm a beef farmer and I'm looking to buy a calf, I really don't. It, it has no impact on me going forward, whether it was easy calved or whether it was a short gestation or, you know, so really it's the beef traits that are coming in. So what they're looking at is in relation to carcass quality, carcass conformation, carcass weight, um, its growth rates, its feed intake characteristics. Um, do you know, so all of those come into play in relation to the CBV value. Mm. Um, I suppose one of the main emphasis that was on previously was looking at those that were heavy carcass weights and good carcass conformation. But what was realized then was those animals more than likely because of the fact that they've gained extra weight have spent extra days on the farm and there's a cost on keeping those animals on the farm so they put an extra cost of euro 35 per day and that's a charge for those animals if they've taken 
um, longer to finish. So the age of slaughter is also coming into that. So obviously we want an animal that will grow fast, will get finished at, at, a, at a younger age, and it will meet the requirements in relation to, to carcass confirmation and specifications. Very good. Plus the CBV value is just putting an economic value on, on all of those and how much more it can leave in my pocket at the end of the day. So I'm right in saying every calf is going to have that commercial beef value rank um, and it's available there. Um, so they have to obviously have their sire recorded um, in order to have that, that figure available to them. Um, I suppose the majority of those that are using AI will be recording the sires. If you're using a stock bull, you have to record the sire in order for the, the CBV value to, to appear on it. Um, it, it. It's available for, I suppose, an individual farmer on his own stock. We had hoped it will be displayed in all the marts going forward this year. It is being sh displayed in marts where the parentage has been verified. So where those animals have been genomically tested. Currently, it's not available for those that haven't had parentage verified. Um, but look, that's something that's going to be worked on going forward. But for those that are selling um, privately, um, it's, it's available there. And there is a CBV value as long as they're meeting those criteria. So like I said, the the dairy dairy male or the dairy beef um, male or females going forward. Yeah. Just one further question in there, and maybe what would you say to this dairy farmer in terms of that their calf buyers or the, or the beef farmers aren't actually asking, you know, are they AI bred calves? Um, what's the sire? Um, what is the CBV value? What What would you say to those? to those dairy farmers, I suppose, in terms of the, the question really is they aren't they aren't being asked for it. Um... I suppose they, they mightn't be being asked for it. I suppose it's it's a new um, figure that's come out and it's probably not been um, spoken about prior to it, it was spoken about, I suppose, at the back end of last year. But it's something that's new. But I suppose it's it's in the dairy farmers interest in order to show, look, I have these calves for sale. And if we take that the the average of a of a dairy beef cross is coming in at 69 euro and, and mine are at, at 150. So they're well above the average. So therefore it's in your interest to to look at superior quality calves and what you can get. They may not be asked for it, but it doesn't mean that they don't have to give that information. And it's a very easy explain when there's a euro value put on it, that at the end of the day, my calf should leave you 100 euro more than what the average is going to do. And when we look at when we look root ultimately at the margins um, on cattle rear and enterprise, 100 euros per animal um, makes up a significant amount of, of the margin, obviously, associated with these animals. So that really lies in, in, in the dairy farmers hands is what you're saying with with the quality of bulls that they choose to use. Yeah. And look, at we're not we're not saying that we're we're foregoing any of the, the criteria that we have. We still want the easy calving and we still want the appropriate gestation length as well, too. But we want to do that and bring the beef merit traits into it as well. I might just give you the final word then for for listeners in terms of they're going picking their bulls now. Um, give me a one minute kind of um, the two or three key points they need to look out for this breeding season. I suppose um, start with selecting the cows that you're going to use for your replacements and everything else. Then obviously we'll come in for your for your um, your beef breeding side of it. Um, take the time that you put into selecting your dairy sires, put that same time into selecting your beef sires, run your sire advice report, which will allocate three different bulls, the most appropriate ones. Then when you've selected your team um, to those cows going forward and make sure to order those in advance so that you have what you want available to you when you start your breeding season. Thanks very much, Ruth. Um, excellent insights there into um, a topic, I suppose, that's that's. Um, uh, has been talked about a lot over the over the coming weeks. Um, so uh, in, in terms of increasing the quality of, of the dairy farmers calf crop, as you said, really, it's about it's about building trust. It's about building rapport and, and that repeat custom. Um, and we'll do that by by improving the quality of our AI sires. Um, so for the viewers, George will be back next week and George will have dairy farmer Eugene Lawler. Um, on to talk about um, matching stock and rate to grass grown at, at farm level. Uh, very interesting in terms of what Eugene has actually, Eugene has actually um, done over the last couple of years on his own farm. So look at, thanks a million and um, farm safely. Thank you. Bye bye. That's all for this week's bonus episode from the Let's Talk Dairy webinar series. 
and don't forget to look out for more bonus episodes each week. I'll be back with the usual Dairy Edge podcast on Monday, so do listen in then. I'm Stuart Childs, and thanks for listening.